Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, well, we continue talking about calculus. We have basically um, completed, as far as theory is concerned, um, differentiation and integration of simple functions. And I would like to continue this with uh, functions of more than one argument. And the first thing to talk about is uh, there is uh, a thing which is called a partial derivative. So basically partial derivative um, is uh, some kind of a operation similar to regular derivative, but the partial derivative is for functions of more than one argument. You can take partial derivative of the function of two arguments, three arguments, etc. We will mostly be concerned about two arguments because uh, three and more etc they are absolutely analogous so we will have all the examples uh, or almost all examples related to functions of uh, two arguments so the theme of this lecture is partial derivative of the function of two or more arguments this lecture is part of the um, advanced course of mathematics for teenagers and high school students. It's presented on unizor.com. I recommend you to watch this lecture from this website um, rather than from any other uh, source uh, because every lecture has detailed notes which you can basically consider as, as a textbook if you wish and it has certain problems and exams for uh, those students who are interested in self-evaluation of themselves and some other functionality which is basically described on the website and the website itself is completely free and there are no advertising so it's completely outside of the financial world all right so partial derivative number one as I was saying we will consider only functions of two arguments For example, or these are two functions which we will be mostly using in this particular lecture. So these are examples of function of two arguments. All right. Now, um, obviously, the partial derivative it's called derivative, and it's definitely based on the concept of a regular derivative. I assume that everything about regular derivatives you do know and if you don't just go to a corresponding lecture of the course. So I assume that there are no problems with regular derivatives. Okay now how can function of two arguments can be represented graphically? Well it's uh, well for function of one argument we need coordinate plane and it's basically some kind of a curve right? For function of two arguments, we are talking about three-dimensional representation. And there is some kind of a surface. Something like this. So for each pair of x and y, we go up and get the z. So that's how it goes. Now, do you remember what is the purpose of regular derivative? You remember we we're talking about, for instance, um, steepness of the curve. It's measured by the regular derivative at point, right? So the steepness can be something like this. At this point, we have this tangential line, and the tangent of this is basically a derivative. So if it's steeper, the derivative will be higher. If it goes up, it's positive. If it goes down, 
the tangent will be negative, so the function will be um, decreasing. Uh, if there is a maximum, local maximum at this point, our tangential line would be horizontal and obviously the steepness will be zero. So steepness is one of the things. Another thing is a um, rate of change. Um, but let's talk about steepness in this particular case. If I have a curve, let's say it's a, some kind of a earth surface with mountains and stuff like this, what is the steepness of Mount Everest, for instance? Well, that's not such an easy thing to, to, uh, to answer, because if you go one route, you will have maybe one kind of a steepness at, at, at every point, and if you go through another route, it will be another. How can we measure the steepness um, of, uh, of a particular uh, surface at a particular point? Well, in case of, uh, of the surfaces, we can't do it in, in one particular number. But what we can do is, we can use these two major dimensions, x and y, and have two different um, sections, if you wish. So we will cut with a surface which is parallel to the x, so it's something like this. And as a result of this surface, we will have some kind of a curve. And within this surface, this intersection between the, uh, between the plane and the, and the surface of our function, uh, uh, which represents the graph of our function, so I have certain curve, right? And on this plane, at that particular point, I can determine my steepness. But this is a steepness related to x direction, right? Now, I can do the similar thing and cut it with plane which is parallel to the y. And you will have some other curve, right? So I have one plane and one curve and another plane perpendicular obviously to the first plane and I have another curve. Now these two curves I would say major, well I can say probably major, uh, curves which, uh, which basically describe the behavior of the whole surface in this point. Is it a complete description of the surface? Of course not, because I can actually slightly change the direction of the cut and I will have a different curve as a result. The intersection would be different. And it might be greater or smaller than any one of those. However, what's important is that these are two like major components and in some way they do describe the steepness of the surface. Not completely, but to a certain extent. Because if along this surface the curve is very steep and along that curve is the curve is very very steep then we can assume that the whole surface is relatively steep in this particular case so these two the derivative of, of, of this curve within this plane and derivative of this uh, um, curve in that plane they do describe to a certain extent the behavior of the surface itself now if it's something like a local mountain of the surface let's consider you have a surface which has this local maximum so it's like a, like a top of the hill, all right? Then, if we will cut it with this surface or with that surface, you will still have a curve which will have a local maximum at that point, right? So imagine you are talking about the surface of the globe and the point is a North Pole, which is, you know, can be represent, it, it actually is the top of the surface, right? in a proper orientation, north up, etc. And then any um, uh, section of this globe surface and a plane which is parallel to the axis, this way or that way or this way, all of these intersections will actually produce meridians which will have a maximum, local maximum exactly at North Pole, right? So this is my Earth, this is my North Pole, and any um, plane which goes through the axis 
something like this. It will produce some kind of a meridian which will uh, have a maximum at this point. So, maximum of the surface results in the local maximum of each of these two major um, um, intersection curves, right? So, it does make sense to learn something about the surface by analyzing these two major curves. Okay, so how can I actually get it? Well, it's very easy actually. What does it mean that I am in this particular plane, for instance? So this is the plane parallel to the y where x is equal to a, let's say. Now if x is equal to a, then within this plane my function is actually f of a comma y a is fixed right so all these points are described by this where a is where this plane intersects the x-axis and obviously as y is changing i am moving along this curve so i can actually make uh, I can take a derivative by y of this function and I get some kind of a function uh, as a result of that it's a derivative um, of this curve at uh, any point at any particular y um, and if I will take the this plane which is parallel to x and it intersects something as y is equal to b it intersects the y-axis then my function is f of x b it's a function of only one argument x and i can actually have a derivative of this function so my point is that i can actually take derivative along these curves by um, substituting instead of x some kind of a constant and then differentiating by y or substituting instead of y some kind of a constant and differentiating by x because in this case the function actually becomes the function of one argument y in this case function becomes some kind of a, a function of one argument x all right now um let me just give the um, in this particular case, let me just calculate what it is. So, my first uh, function, z is equal to x squared plus y squared. If x is a constant a, then my function becomes, well, it's not z actually anymore. Function becomes a squared plus y squared. And if I will differentiate it by y, a is a constant, so uh, the derivative of a sum is sum of derivative. a is a constant, so it's zero. So it's differentiating basically only y squared, which is 2y. Now, if I differentiate x squared plus b squared by x, I'll have similar, I will have, I will have 2x, right? If I differentiate my another example, x squared y cubed, if I differentiate if x is equal to a and differentiate by y, I will have what? a squared is a constant, so it's uh, factored out, right? So different, uh, differentiating uh, y uh, uh, to, to the power of 3 will be 3y squared. So it's 3a squared y squared. And finally, if I have x squared b cubed, differentiate by x, I will have 2b uh, cubed x the first degree right so this is basically the my um, uh, derivatives of this or that uh, function which describe the behavior of this or that uh, curve its derivative actually so for instance if I want to know when the function reached the maximum I can just uh, equated to zero and I could find that if my x is fixed to a then by resolving this is equal to zero I can find 
the local maximum, for instance. Now, when it's positive, I can say that the curve actually is growing. If it's negative, I can uh, uh, say it, it, it's decreasing, etc. So all these normal properties um, which uh, we used to have with regular functions of uh, one argument are applicable in this particular case. But what's important is we have to fix one of the, one of the argument to get the behavior um, as it depends on the other argument. Now, the first step which I would like actually to make in this particular case is that we don't really have to substitute x is equal to a. We can just assume that x is a constant. Now, if x is a constant, because it's true for any a, right? So, which means it, it's actually a function of a as well, but we are talking about behavior as it depends on y if my x is fixed to this particular value a. But it can be fixed to any other value. So what does make sense is forget about a or b and just say that this and this and this and this can basically contain x and y and x and y. But this is important, you see, this index. This means we are differentiating by y having x only as a uh, fixed variable. Same thing here and same thing here. So, now let me give you a definition of the partial derivative. Partial derivative of function of, let's say, two arguments is, uh, by one of them, is a derivative by uh, this particular uh, argument, assuming that the other argument is a constant, is fixed. So, if you have this function and you have to have a partial derivative by y, you assume x is a constant, and then differentiating by y gives you the constant gives 0, and this gives you 2i. Now, this function, if you would like to differentiate it by x, then you assume that y is constant, so y cube actually retain, is retained, and only x is differentiating, so this is like a factor, it goes out, so differentiating x squared would give you 2x. So this is the definition of the partial derivative. So you need a function, and you need one particular argument you're, you're differentiating by. Because in, in case of a function of one argument, there is only one argument, so you know what you're differentiating by. In case of more than one argument, you have to specify this is a partial derivative of this function by y, or, differenti or partial derivative by x, um, and, and then you can actually do the calculation. You assume that all other arguments are constant, you just pay attention to one particular funct uh, function argument and differentiate by this function using the regular um, uh, uh, type of our, uh, calculations, whatever is necessary to, to, to take a derivative. So, that's where we are. Now, um, Now let me introduce the symbolics. Now this is one of the way how you can actually symbolize that you would like to differentiate by this particular argument. Traditionally, however, uh, there are other um, symbols used for this purpose. And let me just explain what is the symbolics. Now you remember that in case of regular derivative, uh, sometimes we're using g by dx of, let's say, x square y cube. No, we don't need second, x squared. So we are differentiating fu function g, uh, x square by its argument. So you remember this d by dx. And in this case, it's equal to 2x, right? This is a derivative. Similar, um, 
symbolics is used for partial derivatives. The only thing instead of uh, regular letter D like this, we are using a different incarnation of this letter D. It's also D in some font, I don't even know which one. Um, in some languages this is preferable um, uh, symbol for the same letter D. But in any case, that's what we're using. And now we are doing this. D by dx means we are differentiating partially by argument x. You see, in case of function of one argument, you don't really um, uh, need this detail uh, uh, kind of a um, symbol for uh, differentiating because you have only one argument and you don't have to specify so you can just have um, uh, some kind of a prime from for, for first uh, for first derivative right so x square prime would be 2x right so that's easier and shorter than d by dx right but in case of a partial derivative you still have to specify the argument and this is a preferable way of specifying the argument so now you can say this the derivative by x is equal to 2x uh, and y cubed so 2x y cubed and derivative by y of the same thing is equal to 3x square y square. 3y square is the derivative of this and x square is a constant we assume, right? So we are always using a specific argument by which we are differentiating, right? So that's very important and this is a preferable um, symbolics for partial derivatives. Now, now I have two very important notes. Let's consider this function x squared y cubed and let's do its partial derivative by dx. And it's kind of a, all about symbolics as well. Now, um, the result of this is by dx so it's 2x y cube. Now this is also a function of two arguments. One which was considered to be the, the, the argument we are differentiating and the second argument is the one which we considered to be fixed as a constant and that's why we can um, and that's why we can just write this particular expression but as a result we still have a function of two arguments which can be differentiating again di differentiated again either by x or by y so what will be if i would like to do d by dx of d by dx uh, of x squared y cube what happens in this case so it's a partial derivative by x of partial derivative by x. Now, if it's by x, y is constant. So basically uh, factor out and x to the first degree. So the result would be this. Now, but I can also differentiate uh, twice by y. Let's say if I have this by y. Um, so x square is constant, so uh, y to the power of 3, it's 3y square, right? So it's 3x square y square. Now I can differentiate twice by y. So I'm differentiating by y again, which is what? Uh, 2y times this, so it's 6x square y. Now, I can actually do it uh, in a mixed way. 
first by x and then by y. Nobody prohibits it, right? So let's differentiate for dx and then uh, x squared y cubed. So first we're differentiating by y of this expression and then we differentiate by x. So what happens? By y would be this and now by x so x squared derivative is 2x, so it's 6xy squared, right? Or I can do vice versa. I can first differentiate by x, getting this, and then differentiate by y, which is y square, 3y squared, so it's 6x y square. Now first about symbolics. This is kind of a cumbersome um, symbol and it's really done like this. d2 by dx square. You see dx and dx it's it's pure symbolic. All right so that's why we are doing it this way. Now this is obviously d2 by dy square and what is this how can i shorten this particular uh, notation well it's d2 d x d y and this is obviously d2 d y dx okay so these are shorter notations which are actually the ones which we are using uh, in mathematics and the only thing which I left here for this particular case is look at this is that a coincidence well no under relatively broad conditions, these two mixed partial derivatives uh, of the function of two arguments by one and then by two or by second and then by first are supposed to be the same. But this is a separate matter. We'll talk about this later. So it's not a coincidence that they are the same. Now these are obviously different. Okay, so this is my first important note. The second important note is very short. Um, it's basically something which I was talking to the very beginning. Um, in as much as we can talk about partial derivatives about uh, of the functions of two arguments, we can talk about partial derivative of uh, function of many argument by one specific argument, which means that specific argument we are actually considering a variable while other arguments we are considering to be uh, constant. Just as an example, if you have something like function f of x, y, z equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and you would like to do d by d y, let's say, of this function. So you consider x and z are constant, so in addition they are disappearing and all it, it has as a result is 2y. Now if your function is a little bit more complex which is involved, which involves other type of arguments, now I'm exemplifying this as the function of three arguments. I can put 23, but it doesn't really matter. Let's say it's x squared y cubed z to the power of four, or something like this. And you are looking for d by dz of this function. So x and y are constant. Z is a function, so we will have uh, four, four z cubed, right? x squared y cubed and z cubed. So it's the definition of the partial derivative is very easily expanded to the function of any number of arguments. However, we will probably mostly be concentrating 
on the functions of two arguments in our partial definition thing. That's it for today. I do recommend you to go to this website and read the notes for this lecture. And other than that, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.